Twelve. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Today we're going to be talking about an advocate's guide to media interviews. And I want you to know a little bit about me and who you're talking to today. So as I said, my name is Michelle. I've been in the field of domestic and sexual violence for about four years now in a variety of different capacities, whether that's advocacy services, rural and urban, as an outreach coordinator, working on a college campus, and working with CICASA as well, like Rosa mentioned. Of those four years, two of those years, I've been working on topics with the media, whether that's interviews myself, preparing other people for interviews, um, you know, working with the media around working with survivors of domestic and sexual violence, a lot of different areas there. I personally have done over 50 interviews on radio, television, and in print, and I have also prepared more advocates and survivors for interviews beyond that. I haven't kept track of that, but it's been a fair number. And so in getting started, I just want to let you all know I'm not here today as a representative of any of the organizations that I've been a part of and I'm not a lawyer or a journalist and I don't pretend to be. I'm just somebody who's here to share my experiences with you and hopefully help you out. And now I want to get to know a little bit more of all, about all of you and um, what you are. So what is your role and I'm going to do a poll here so if you could fill in what your role is or if it's other type that into the chat box and let us let us know what that what that role is so it looks like about 40% of you are advocates 20% are outreach and education 40% are other so let's take a look at what those others are oh, looks like i'm not seeing any in the chat box so if you could type quick what your other position is that would be great because i want to get to know who we're talking to today all right it looks like pretty much everybody's answered and we will close the poll we'll share that with all of you so about 57 percent of you are advocates 14 percent are outreach or educators and 29 percent are other so we'll go ahead and close that. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. All right, oh, it might be in the question box. Let's take a look at that really quick. Oh, you're an intern and this is a second career, survivor seeking second career. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that with the group. I've got another question that I wanna do with you really quick. So I wanna know if you're currently with an agency, you know, does your agency right now, do they work with the media? So we just opened that poll. Yes, you do. Um, you, yes, you want to. No, we don't work with the media. Or no, we just don't want to flat out work with the media. And it's looking like 100% of you are yes, we do. Oh, wait, it changed. Let's see, about 86%. Yes, we do. 14%. Yes, we want to. So I'm glad that you're here today. And that's that's hopefully what we can help you with is how to work with the media or better work with the media in what you're doing already. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and I'll share the results with you really quick. So as you can see, 75% already work with the media and 25% do want to work with the media or you might be doing a little bit here and there and maybe want to advance your work and expand, which is absolutely great. So we're going to go ahead and close that and move on today in talking about what our topics are. So overall, you'll get a sense of what we're going to dive into today. First and foremost, we're going to talk about setting up the interview with news media. Then we'll go into preparing yourself for a media interview, preparing survivors. And then overall, just some tips about working with reporters. First and foremost, setting up the interview. This will go into how to get an interview, setting up the parameters of the interview, and some basic preparations that you can do in general for interviews. How to get the interview. I think it's extremely important to develop a relationship with reporters, regardless of what form of media it is, if it's radio, television, whatever else. Definitely 
look into that. Um, when you do develop those relationships, you're much more likely to have those press releases or statements that you put out there seen and utilized than if you would not have that relationship. And how I view that relationship is sort of like how you would have a relationship with a colleague or a coworker. It's not just a transaction one and done kind of thing. You have to have that ongoing communication with them. You have to say please and thank you and set up boundaries and things like that to have a long-term relationship. Because like I said, that will get your press releases and statements seen. And I highly, highly recommend when you send out press releases or statements, not to do them in a blanket format where you just have that blank space or that block on the email that says media contact. Send it to that individual person who you have built a relationship. So I'm going to send it to just as an example, somebody named Katie at this particular television station and address it directly to her, then it's much more likely to be seen. Another thing that you can do to get interviews is in the field of domestic and sexual violence, we often have a lot of topics and things that are that are very difficult for people to deal with, to listen to. So every once in a while, sending out those fluff pieces or what I've heard they call in the industry are quote unquote kickers. And those can really help you be seen and share something different. So maybe it's a story about you have a bunch of young adults coming to help in your safe house and they really did a great job refurbishing or something like that. Or um, there's a story about a survivor and their their dog their dog who is with them who helps them has helped them through their situation those animal children types of stories that really get to people those kicker stories they like to put those in especially on morning shows and things like that so don't forget about those happy or those fluff pieces as well that add some variety to what you're sending out and you're sharing and if none of the above works for you I highly suggest make a phone call. Call that person. Let them know you've got a story and you want to share it with them. Another way to reach out is in person. If you're going out and about to different networking events and meeting someone from the media, that's a great way to start developing that relationship and a good way to get the interview. For instance, a while back I went to kind of like a little meet the press day that was open to nonprofits. And what we could do is we could sit and listen to them talk about about their experience, how to write a press release, all of these different things. And then at the end, there was time for networking and mingling. And I know some people hate to do that, but I think it's such a good thing to do. Have your cards with you, go up, talk to them, introduce yourself, leave them with your card. And I can guarantee you're much more likely to get that interview and to get follow up from them if you develop that relationship, make that phone call or make that in-person effort with them. It's very important to set parameters with the interview once you've got that interview established. So a lot of times for me, I've set up interviews either through email or over the phone. You likely won't be setting them up in person, but you still need to set those boundaries, whether they're your boundaries, the agency's boundaries that you work for, or the boundaries of a survivor. So some survivor boundaries could be allowing them to choose when and where they're going to meet, letting them know what topics or what questions are off limits for that survivor, and also talking about the level of anonymity that that survivor wants to have. And that is something that can be offered. I think a lot of times the media is hesitant to provide that level of anonymity to survivors or anyone who's speaking out publicly about these issues of domestic and sexual violence. But I think it, it is something that definitely needs to be discussed and each media platform that can be done in a little bit of different ways. So for instance, radio, going on the radio, that can be a lot more anonymous than going on television. To give you an example of this, I was working with a young woman who was a survivor and she wanted to share her story of sexual violence, of sexual abuse at the hands of a boyfriend. And she, she really wanted to do this. She had been doing this on her college campus, being an activist, and she would also um, help with presentations and awareness events and things like that on her campus. But she just didn't want her name and her face out there. And I'm like, well, you know, television might not be the best outlet for you, but let's see if we can work with 
radio because I had a great relationship with one of the stations in town. And so what they were willing to do is since it's radio and they don't do live like podcasts or broadcasts or whatever, her face wouldn't be seen and they were willing to change her name during the course of the interview. So really the only identifying thing about her would be her voice in that situation, which she was comfortable with. So we could change the name, her face wasn't seen and she was comfortable in that situation. So radio can provide a little bit more anonymity than say television. Sure, they can do things like change the name, um, change the voice, maybe deepen it or something like that. Um, they can blur the face. Um, but I've been finding more and more that television stations, they're not willing to do that as much because it's difficult for their for the people who are watching the newscast to connect with that person if they're not seeing a face and they're not knowing a name. It makes them much more skeptical than if they can see those things. But you can still bring that up to reporters that this person would like X, Y, and Z level of anonymity. Can you do that or not? And they should be very open with you in what they can and can't do as far as levels of anonymity. Talking about your personal boundaries within the interview or agency boundaries, to give you an example of that, there have been times where I've received phone calls being asked to comment on another agency and what happened with them in a particular situation or scandal or whatever you want to call it. And so I could say, you know, to them, our agency boundary is we're not going to talk about other organizations, but we can give you basic information about sexual violence or domestic violence and then kind of go from there. So they know what we're willing to talk about and what we're not willing to talk about. Out. If you can, it's great to try to figure out what their angle or their motive is for this particular story. So if you're talking to them over the phone, they may, to give you an example of a hypothetical conversation I've had, they may call up and say, hey, so-and-so, I want to do an interview about sexual assault. And you're like, okay, what specifically about sexual assault? Um, and they'll say maybe like, oh, well, I got your press release that it's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And we would like to have you talk a little bit about that and then kind of pull and prod a little bit more on your end of, you know, do you want statistics about our area? Do you want to know more about our events that we have going on? What What is it specifically? So you can, in doing that, not only try to figure out through asking questions what their angle or motive is on the story, but also you can kind of help shape the story in some ways. You can say, you know, hey, these are the things that I want to talk about or what I'm knowledgeable about. And that's overall more been my experience than anything else is just kind of having that initial conversation around this is what we're going to discuss. This is my area of expertise instead of them just saying this is what we want to talk about. That does happen in some instances where they will say, hey, this is a situation that happened recently that I want to ask you about. That's great, that's fine, but you still need to set those boundaries around it and kind of get a sense of what their angle or motive is, and if possible, get a sense of what their what their um, understanding of domestic and sexual violence is, because that may help you decide if you want to do this interview or not. If they're asking you really victim blaming questions over the phone, and that's not something you're prepared to deal with on camera, saying no to that interview may be in your best interest. Or you can try to get the questions ahead of time, and I put behind that if possible, because that doesn't really happen. It depends on the news media is what I found. So radio, typically, they may give you some questions ahead of time or may even ask you to write up questions that you want them to give you during the interview and put them in order so you can kind of go through and have those prompts because dead time is a no-no. That's terrible on radio. They want you prepared. They want you to be able to speak more than they speak because they're just going to ask you the questions. You're the one who's the topic, the interest at that point in time. So you, if you have that opportunity and you're on radio to write your own questions, definitely do that because you will feel so much more prepared. Now, if we're talking about a television interview related to an event that you have going on, you may get those questions ahead of time. You may have time to sit down with the person who's the anchor and go through this is what we're going to talk about when we're going to talk about it and how much time we have if you can do that again use that prep time but if you are just getting a call from your news station and they're saying we want this to be on at five o'clock tonight we want you to talk about this particular instance of sexual assault 
you probably won't have a lot of time. You might get that phone call at three in the afternoon. They want to air it at five. They want to meet you at 3.30. They're not going to be able to give you questions ahead of time. So knowing that angle or motive is extremely important in that situation. And that will give you a sense of what you're going to be talking about. And you can craft your talking points around that. And we'll talk a little bit more about talking points in a minute. It's also really important when you're working with survivors to secure a safe environment for them and enough time for them to share their story. It can be a very emotional process. So having that time is, is very, very key because they may have to take a break, stop, use the restroom, get a drink of water, do something so they feel comfortable in sharing their story. Another thing I like to ask or a parameter I try to have in place is that that survivor can end the interview at any time if it is not a live interview up until the point that that story airs. Now that is a very difficult request. You can maybe get them to agree to that until you know after the interview is completed and they leave whatever environment you're filming in. But I really like having that in place because it's so important for survivors to feel like they have choice and consent in the situation. They need to feel like they have some control because the violence took away their choices and control. And when you explain it that way to reporters, I think they, they get it a little bit more and are a little bit more willing to concede on certain things. And so I've had it set up in, in certain situations where the reporter knows ahead of time that this person who's a survivor, they might not want to they might back out at some point. I can let them know this person's really hesitant, whatever else, but then as a backup say, but hey, you can interview me on this topic in general or on some other topic to make sure you still have your story in this situation. So trying to get them that if possible. Now, there are some people who think that survivor interviews are really exploitative of the individual or put too much on one person and really make the overall issue just about one person and their story. And to me, that's more about the portrayal of how of how that comes out in print, on television, on radio. So to me, that's more on, on media, but we can help them with the talking points to make people realize that this is one person's story, but it's also a part of a bigger issue and a bigger problem. So one of the ways we can do something like that is if you have a survivor who wants to share a story about their sexual assault and it's a stranger assault, which we know is not as common as acquaintance assaults. We can have them share their story, still get their information out there and empower them in that way, but also make sure that we bring up points through the rest of the interview that stranger sexual assaults are not the norm. They're not the most common situation and bring up some information and stats about that so other people are aware that this can not only happen in stranger situations but also in acquaintance situations of people who are close to you as well. I really think that sharing your story can be healing if it's done in a way where there's positive feedback for the survivor and we'll talk more about that a little bit, a little bit later on. So now I want to hear from you in the chat box. What do you do to prepare for an interview? Type in what you do. Do you do nothing? Do you talk with a supervisor? Do you write out your plan or do something else? So we're going to pull up that chat box really quick so I can see what you all are doing. If you wouldn't mind typing up really quick what it is you do. Let's see, I'm not seeing much about what, what you all are doing. So maybe I'm assuming, oh, let's see, talk with the media team and write out ideas that I want to cover, write it out, chat with supervisor, ask the radio person for specific questions. That's a great idea, really leveraging your relationship with them in order to uh, to learn more. And that's something I definitely recommend doing is once you develop those relationships is finding out more, finding out what you can from them. Like how I learned about kickers are essentially what they call fluff pieces, or you, know, you can get those better questions, write a better uh, PSA or something like that by working with the radio. So I really appreciate you all sharing those thoughts. 
To give you some ideas of basic preparations, I would say overall come up with three talking points. You can have more talking points, but I think your average person, it's really easy for them to have three things in mind. I've heard threes and fives are a good way to go. And those talking points can be about really anything. They can be very, very basic. They don't have to be something huge, like I'm going to say this very long statement. It could just be, this is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I want people to know about that. I want them to know about this particular event that we're having. And I want them to know about our agency and that we're here to help and support survivors of domestic or sexual violence. And you can have and craft canned responses around that. So every single time you say, we're an agency that assists and supports survivors of domestic and sexual violence, and you have that go-to response that will really help you with your nerves. And when you practice, even though you're nervous, you'll be able to get that out and you won't stumble and stutter over your words. If it's a survivor situation, maybe your three talking points are around pieces of their story that they want to highlight, or they throw in a statistic or two, or maybe they even give information on how to get help or how they received help themselves. They can be really simple like that. They don't have to be super structured, but I would practice a few phrases or canned responses around those particular talking points. It's also extremely important in general to know your statistics in general and your research and do this ahead of time. Like I was saying before, if you get a call at 3 p.m. and they wanna put your interview on the news at 5 p.m. and do the interview at 3.30, you're not going to have a lot of time to look up statistics on sexual violence. So what are those base statistics that you're always going to use or need? I'm sure there's going to be a point where they ask, well, how common is sexual assault in Colorado or in our area or things like that? And having that information readily available at your fingertips is great. And keeping up to date with what is the latest research on the topics that we're experts in. What's the latest research on teen dating violence? I've had that happen a lot where people call and say, hey, there is a study and it was about teen dating violence and about the rates amongst girls and boys. What, what do you think about this particular study? And so at that point, it's great to ask if they're asking you about any type of research, ask where did you get your information and can you send me a copy of the particular research that you were looking at? So you can look at and read and see what that reporter received because you don't want to be looking somewhere else and getting something different and being confused and all those different things. But I will say it's also very important to not only see what they're looking at, but also look at other sources if possible, if you have the time. But be prepared, have those things ahead of time and know what you're typically asked about. It's also a really good idea to have a mock question and answer session. And you, if you're not comfortable with role plays and things like that, could do something along the lines of let's play the what if game. Sitting down with your supervisor and saying, here's the topic, here's the things that they want me to talk about. How are we gonna craft responses around this? Or what questions might they ask me and go from there? Those types of things can be really, really beneficial. I think mock question and answer sessions are also really great when you're working with survivors in particular. So definitely, if nothing else, use those basic preparations. We're going to move into a little bit more about preparing yourself, such as what you should wear, being the expert yourself, and interview tips now. What should I wear? This is a question I would get a lot when I was scheduling or setting up interviews for other people. And honestly, it really depends. It depends on what the topic is, what your role is. Are you a survivor sharing your story in your home in a relaxed, comfortable environment? And so you'd probably want to dress how you normally dress. Or are you a professional with your agency? And if you're a professional with an agency, I would say as a general rule, wear business attire. We would have people within one of the agencies that I worked for who would just keep a blazer, a jacket with them at all times in their office or in their car, myself included, because we never knew when they were going to call us for an interview or for expert witness testimony or something like that. So having that blazer just to throw it on, even if you've got jeans on on the bottom, is a great way to dress up and look more professional. But as I said, it really just depends on the situation. If you're talking about a 5K color run that you're doing and you're wearing business attire, that's not as fun. 
maybe that's a situation where it's okay for you to wear your running gear, have some of those colors with you and things like that to grab that attention. When we're talking about grabbing attention, one of the things that you might want to do is wear more solid colors versus busy patterns and things like that that can be distracting to the eye while you're on camera. That being said, there may be times where you want to be distracting or have a busy pattern on. For instance, um, for Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, the color is orange. So I did an interview and wore an orange busy outfit so people would notice that and know like, hey, what is that orange about? Oh, it's about Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, and people are wearing that to show their support and ending that violence, those kinds of things. Um, one color that I would steer clear of, especially if you're going into the studio for an interview, is green. If you don't know if there's going to be a green screen or not, steer clear of that. Um, one of the situations I had, luckily I knew that the studio used green screen because it was very small, was um, for a fundraiser. We had the chairs of an event go into the television station and sit down and interview for this segment that they do every day. And so they sat down, did the interview on chairs, and behind them was a green screen. So luckily I let them know in advance, don't wear green, because if you do wear green, you're going to disappear in the background. You may be a disembodied head at that point in time, which is something that you definitely don't want to happen. The last piece of advice here that I'll give is if you um, have your hair down or bangs or things like that, try to have hair out of your face. You can have bangs or a little face framing or whatever else, but there has been some research that shows if you have hair out of your face versus in your face, you are perce perceived to be more credible um, that, and not like you're hiding if you don't have that hair in your face. So just something, something to keep in mind. A lot of times, too, I get asked questions about, well, what about the microphone? Where should I look? And things like that. It can vary in the situation. So ask the reporter that you're working with. They'll typically let you know. But as a general rule, if you're doing a television interview, they can let you mic yourself, slide it through your clothes or things like that. So it's a good idea to wear a jacket and slacks if you don't want to have to slide the mic through a dress or something like that to hide it. And they'll typically have you look at the reporter and not directly into the camera, which is great because it's a lot less intimidating than staring down the barrel of that camera. So just a few things about what you should wear. Being the expert, that can be the scary part for a lot of people. You know, oh, I'm not an expert. Who am I, you know, to be doing these things? Who am I to be giving this interview? And I think, you know, you just need to be confident in yourself. You're doing these, these this type of work day in and day out you know your topic, but if you feel like you don't know your topic, continually do your homework and your research so you can be prepared. Another option is to, to figure out who is the best person or the most knowledgeable person for this particular topic. I am not a clinician. I'm an advocate. So when we would be asked about, you know, what is the psychology behind this or that kind of situation, I would go to one of the clinical staff on our team and ask them to talk about that. Another example of this would be, uh, we were asked to, at one of the agencies I was with, comment on a situation where a pregnant woman was killed by her intimate partner, and they wanted to kind of know about the, some of the psychology behind that and how this could happen and all these different things. And I thought to myself, oh gosh, you know, I don't know a whole lot about domestic violence and pregnancy, and I'm definitely not qualified to speak to some of the you know psychological things in this situation. So oh, we have a counselor, a fantastic counselor who knows about this topic, who has provided presentations on it, and interestingly enough, is currently pregnant herself. And so you kind of add that human interest piece of, piece of she knows about pregnancy because she's currently pregnant. She knows about this area because she is a counselor herself, has a degree and background in all of this. So she would be a great person for this interview. Thinking about things like that can also help you and take a little bit off of your plate if you end up being the person who's doing a lot of interviews for your particular agency. Again, I want to stress, do your homework. Keep up to date on research and stats and things like that. Keep doing your mock question and answer sessions. Have those canned statements, but also realize that it's okay for you to say things like, 
I don't have that information, and then ask if you can get back to them with that particular information. Some other things, you know, you could say, I, I, um, we can't comment on individual cases due to confidentiality or things like that. Having those can statements ready to go and not necessarily being the person to just blurt out or provide information that you don't know. If you're doing those things, it can be really detrimental to your relationship with the reporter, with the community, it can damage you know, your reputation overall as an expert. So it really is okay to say in certain situations, hey, I don't know, but Something I would really avoid saying is no comment. In my opinion, it's better just to not respond than to say no comment. If you get a phone call about, you know, we want to talk to you about this particular thing, X, Y, and Z, can you say anything about that? Saying no comment is is bad. <laughs> it's almost like um, making you look guilty in a lot of ways if you've ever, you know, read a story and someone has said no comment. I would rather, you know, have something be like, we, um, we can't um, comment on this case because of confidentiality or other pieces like that. Having that kind of canned statement ready to go is much, much better than just no comment. Moving on here to just some general interview tips for basic preparations. I wrote a blog post a while back for CICASA, and it was called uh, An Advocate's Guide to Media Interviews. So after this, if you want to check that out, it's named the same thing as this webinar, you can learn a little bit more about these particular talking points because we don't have enough time to really go into depth about all of these different pieces. But First and foremost, when you're doing the interview, stick to your talking points. You can actually drive the interview. You can be the one to answer the questions in a way that you get your points across that you want to get across. You don't necessarily have to answer the questions in a way that, um, you don't have to do it in a way that directly answers their questions. So that's why I have that second point of think like a politician. If you've ever watched a debate or a more recent debate, you know that they start out kind of answering the question that the moderator asked them, but then they move into whatever topic or agenda or their talking points that they have. You can do that too. And it's kind of an art form. You may get called out on it if you don't do it very skillfully, but just stick to your talking points. You know, stick to what it is you want to say in that situation. And if you do that, they can't force you to answer the questions that they want answered. Just stick to those talking points. And that really helps with nerves and it will get your point across, as I was saying. But I will caution you and say to avoid vague words when you're speaking about things. So saying stuff like this, that, or it might not be the best idea. So to give you an example of this, you could say when situations like this happen, wait a minute, what is this in that situation? Are you commenting on the individual case you were asked to comment on? Are you talking about sexual assault in general? It's important to be very specific in that situation so your words can't be misconstrued or misunderstood by the public. So instead of saying when situations like this happen, saying when sexual assaults happen, it's much more specific and directed towards what you want to talk about and there's no room for any type of misunderstanding in the way you phrased it. Another thing too to think about is the I versus we. Are you speaking from your perspective as an individual or are you speaking from your agency's perspective? That's definitely something to keep in mind as an advocate speaking out on this topic. And I, I think about that because I think about, I don't want to get myself in trouble by stating my opinion and then having it come off as the agency opinion. So being very careful about that, weighing that within your interview. Who exactly are you representing, the I or the we? Speaking in short sentences is another thing to do just in general when you're interviewing. When it's not a live interview, it's actually okay to pause and think for a moment when you're asked a question and then dive into giving your answer. But speaking in short, succinct sentences is the best way to go to, again, to avoid having your words misconstrued or to have any misunderstanding. So those short, 
sentences that say exactly what you want to say without the vague words are the best way to go. And you'll get really great clips out of that because you may give to television an interview where you sit down with a reporter for about like 15 minutes and all they use is like one minute of what you said. And it's a very short clip of what you said. So speaking in those short sentences will help you. That's not as big of a concern when you're in a situation where the interview is live, if that's on radio or television or whatever else. But again, avoiding those vague words and speaking in short sentences really help in those situations where you don't want to be misconstrued or misunderstood. Overall, too, it's very important to stay in interview mode, to stay in this mode of, I am being interviewed right now, I am on my best behavior, I am only saying things that I feel should be said. Because while the concept of off the record exists, it's not always a real thing in my experience. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of really, really ethical reporters out there who off the record is off the record, but I think to know that you have to develop the relationship like we were talking about before in order to know that. But if you don't know that, then what I would say is stay in that interview mode. When you're talking on the phone, only say things that you are comfortable with going out publicly. When you are preparing for the interview, putting the mic on, doing a little small talk, Stay in interview mode. Only say what you feel you should say. Don't put your foot in your mouth. Make jokes that could be misconstrued in any way, shape, or form. And until you shake their hand and walk that person out that door, you are in interview mode. You are only saying the things that you think you should say that you are okay with going public. To give you a couple examples of this, um, I met with a reporter, um, kind of a challenging individual, not naming names here, and they got me all mic'd up, had the camera ready to go, and they pointed the camera at me and they said, Michelle, what do you think about this particular case? Not as a Tessa representative, but as Michelle. And I was thinking to myself, oh, no, 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 I know that camera's pointing in my face. And I think the reporter could tell what was going through my mind because they turned the camera away and said, it's just me and you talking here. The camera's not on or anything like that. And I'm thinking to myself, you just mic'd me. I have a microphone on. So that could be shared. You could, you know, show what I said without a clip of my face and show some other clip at that point in time. Or you could just add that to the story in your own commentaries, what I'm thinking really quickly through my mind. So I said something along the lines of, you know, we're not here to discuss what I think. We're here to discuss my agency's perspective on this issue. And that was a really respectful way of, of just saying, you know, this is not what we're talking about. I am not going to comment as myself and have you use that for a piece of sensationalism or something like that. So it's important to stay in interview mode. And another quick example I'll give you of this is there was that um, information, I think it was from datingadvice.com or something like that, that came out not too long ago related to uh, like the worst cities for sexual assault or, or something like that um, in, in the United States. And there were a bunch in Colorado, but what a lot of people missed is that data was not per capita and where they pulled their data from had specifically stated something like you, you know, should not use these numbers to compare. They're just basic numbers here. And so got a lot of, a lot of calls from reporters about, you know, what do you think about this? Is our city unsafe? Blah, 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 all these different things. And um, wasn't really asked anything about the validity of this information. And afterwards I was talking to a reporter and saying, you know, this data isn't per capita and mentioning all these different things. And um, she had asked me if she could use that in the interview. And I said, yes, of course. But, you know, she didn't necessarily have to ask me, you know, can I use that information you gave me in the interview? And she was one of the few reporters that picked up on that and used it in her story, which was great because that was a big piece that most people we're using, but it wasn't done within the context of the formal interview. So again, stay in interview mode if at all possible. Some specific tips for you as advocates, there's a bunch of advocates in the audience here. First and foremost, remove jargon, remove that technical speak that you may use every day, like saying SANE or TPO. When you're giving an interview, say sexual assault nurse examiner, and instead of TPO, say temporary protective order or something like that, because the general public won't know what you're talking about when you use those acronyms per se. 
Second, I like to keep it as general as possible. You likely will be asked to, co to comment on particular cases, and that's something that I personally didn't really like to do. I liked to keep it general, talking about this is what sexual assault is, this is the rate within our community, this is how we can help, because I'm thinking, what if that survivor is watching this commentary right now? Or what if I work in a large agency and we're actually seeing this person? Is that breaching their confidentiality in some way, shape, or form if we have someone from our organization talking about this particular case and giving those specifics? So that's why I personally like to keep it as general as possible. Now, there can be some exceptions. Um, one of the exceptions that I had made was when uh, the situation with Janae and Ray Rice came out domestic violence. Uh, that's a person in the public eye. There were a lot of people talking about it. It was a great opportunity to share information about domestic violence. So th there are some cases where you may make exceptions, but you need to know what your boundaries are and what your exceptions are within those situations. Because think about it, survivors are seeing this. If it's not the survivor themselves, maybe it's another survivor who's watching this. And is what you're saying inviting to them or is it alienating to them? Think about that. That's very, very important. Another important thing to do is sidestep the sensationalism. Try to avoid that if at all possible. You may get a sense that a reporter wants more of a sensational story. And to give you an example of this, I had a reporter who was asking me about a case um, of a man who was going around exposing himself to young women flashing people. And he was like, well, how how terrible is this? How gross is this situation? And I just wouldn't answer that. I wouldn't buy into that. I would say things like, you know, well, unfortunately, this is something that happens within the community. We need to be aware of it. There's support and resources for people. And it was funny because when the actual piece aired, there were all these people off the street talking about how, oh my gosh, this was so you know terrible and disgusting and stuff like that. And then they get to the segment about the organization I was with and it moved into, but one organization that is not surprised by this is organization X and here's why and giving like the information and things like that. And I thought that was, that was really funny because that sensationalism, it helps no one. We all know that that's gross and that's terrible and that's something that should not be happening but we don't need to terrify people and we need to give people resources. We need that to share information, to spread information, not to spread fear and myths and all of these different things. So try to avoid that if you can. And as I have been saying all along, remember survivors are listening and they're watching. Firsthand, I have had experiences where people have come into my agency and said, I wanted to meet you specifically because I saw you on television or I heard you on the radio and you're the reason why I came in for help today. You have that power being on television, on radio, and in print. And if you are in inviting and not alienating, you can actually bring clients into your office and help people take that step take that first step to receive help and services. We're going to transition a little bit now and talk about preparing survivors themselves, questions to ask them before, how to prep them, and having a game plan with them when they're going into an interview. These are some questions I typically like to ask survivors. They might not be in this particular order. And if you want to learn more about this, this is another thing that I wrote a blog post on for CICASA. And the title of it is, am I ready to interview? Questions to ask yourself. So not only is it from the perspective of questions that survivors should ask themselves, but you can pose this as someone who's working with them and preparing them, pose these questions to them. First and foremost, are you ready for public scrutiny? Are you ready for your story to go viral or for your anonymity to be exposed? In this day and age, we can't really assure anonymity. Um, sure, they can put all those measures in place like I talked about before, blurring faces, and um, you know, changing names, changing voices, all this stuff, but maybe somebody recognizes a tattoo on the hand or recognizes a voice or something like that and in the comment section is saying, I think this is so-and-so or whatever else. You need to be prepared for that. If that does happen, what are you going to do? Also, the story could go viral. 
It could be picked up by other news outlets. It could be turned into a meme or something like that. I think that's most people's biggest fear and why they don't want to do interviews is they're so worried like, oh my God, I'm going to be turned into a joke on YouTube or a meme or, or something like that. And I don't think that typically happens, but at the same time, it's definitely something to be thinking about. Are you ready for something like that to happen to you? And just in general, I think the public scrutiny is a big thing, whether it's in the comment section or on Facebook and Twitter or whatever else. You just have to know that there are people who are just going to dislike you and say terrible things. And um, do you even want to look at the comment section in that situation or do you just want to avoid it entirely? I'm kind of of the mindset, let's avoid the comment section because it's mostly just people spouting off opinions who don't really even know what they're talking about or know the person that they're talking about in most cases. Another question to ask is, do you have a support system or who will stand by you through this? I think it's really important to not only have that friends and family support system, but to also have that professional support system because in sharing your story, maybe a detail comes out that uh, your family members didn't know about and it kind of causes them to have some mental anguish or emotional anguish in the situation and they're not sure how to react. Having that person who is steady and non-judgmental and knows how to walk you through that, I think is, is key when you're looking at a situation of I'm going to be interviewed. In fact, this is probably not a very popular opinion, but oftentimes when I was looking for someone to who would interview or in talking to people who would interview, I liked to have the person being interviewed be somebody who is one or more years removed from their situation with professional support. And if that wasn't an option and they really wanted to share their story as, a, as an empowerment and a healing tool for themselves, I would have them practice several times in safe environments first. So maybe that's speaking to a volunteer group or to, um, you know, a group of a community group of people who is is very supportive of your cause and getting them ready that way to have those initial positive receptions and be able to prepare them for the potentially victim blaming questions they might receive when they're doing a news interview. Um, there's ways that I've seen those victim blaming questions come out even in supportive environments that are more about I'm asking you this question because I want to learn, not because I'm doubting your story or anything like that and how they react to those um, more ignorant types of questions. They're just, you know, looking for a way to figure this out and understand better. Um, how they respond to that can really help you gauge if that person is ready, but they should also be able to say for themselves too, I am ready and I want to, I want to share my story. And the last piece of that is in judging if a person is ready. Are they comfortable deflecting questions? Are they comfortable standing up for themselves and saying, you know, this is something we agreed to not talk about in my interview or go back to their talking points and not necessarily directly answer the question. That, that is something that I feel individuals should be able to do. It's a difficult skill. So again, those mock question and answers, practicing with safe environments first is, is a really great way to go to gauge that and to prepare someone. So we're just not throwing them in there and hoping for the best. Another thing I will say when we're talking about questions to ask, and again, might not be a popular opinion, is thinking about in this particular case under the category of public scrutiny, has there been a conviction in the case or not? What's going on currently with the person who is the perpetrator of the violence? Uh, or have they died? Are they incarcerated? Is there any you know, potential situation where there might be retribution going on, where they may seek legal action or things like that? Most times names are not said and not mentioned of the accused person when you are looking at um, print media and um, television and things like that, because reporters are very aware of this, I think, especially after um, situations like Rolling Stone and UVA, as well as a situation with um, Emma Solkowitz and Columbia University and things like that, where uh, people who are the accused are speaking out, maybe even suing in the situation. So again, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a journalist. This is a question you could have with somebody who you develop a relationship with in that field, but it's definitely something to, to think about when you're working with survivors and helping to prepare them. What's going on with the person who is their perpetrator in this situation? 
So overall, just, just a few things for you to think about. And like I said, there is a blog post that I wrote about this, Am I Ready to Interview? Questions to Ask Yourself from CICASA that you may get a little bit more information from that we just don't have time to cover today during our webinar. Now I want to ask you another question from the chat box. I want to hear from you all. How do you prepare survivors for interviews if that's something you do? We don't do that, nothing. We have a long chat, we practice questions, you know, other things that, that you do in order to prepare survivors. Let me see here. Oh, it looks like we might have some commentary or questions going on here. Let's scroll to the bottom. See, how do you not babble, write down your answers? Um, along the question of how to not babble, I think that goes along the lines of knowing your talking points, like, like we said before, and also practicing and having canned responses. So those short phrases that are your go-to things to say, that's typically what helps me. And practice, practice, practice. I can tell when I practice and when I don't practice. When you don't practice, I feel like that's when the babbling starts to happen. And when you do practice, that seems to go away. So it sounds like a lot of you are saying things like, um, I write down my answers, write it out, those different kinds of things. If there's anything else you want to add to how you prepare, definitely feel free to do that. I'll check back with that again in a minute. But I now have some prep work things that I think are a must when you're working with a survivor. I think first and foremost, it's really helpful for you and for them to map out their story. And that can look like a lot of different things. That could be, I'm going to visually draw out my story if I'm a visual person or like literally make a map of what happened to me. You might work with somebody who's much more, um, you know, using the logical side of their brain, um, less creative and say, I'm going to put a timeline together, a chronological order type of thing where I go through my story and map the highlights. And from there, you can gather the talking points for them. You can gain those pieces that they think are, are most important to share with their audience or what they want to want to share. Something that I always try to do, though, and include as a talking point is a piece of empowerment or positivity. It's sort of like the where are they today or how are they doing now kind of thing. Um, so they can say, you know, I went through this, but now I'm a strong person. I have this amazing job. I have this amazing family. Whatever it is that's positive in their life, have that shared. So it's not just a focus on all of this negative stuff. It's what they've accomplished now, too. And I think that's really important for other survivors who are out there watching to see that, to see that you can get through this and there is help and there are services and you're strong enough to do this. You really, really can make it through. That's that's definitely something I like to to put in there. And it's important also to do the mock questions and answers with them to go through, pretend to be the reporter and ask questions and ask difficult questions too. Ask some of those questions that they don't want to be asked about, those off limits topics and see how they respond and prepare them to respond and give them those canned responses of, of you know, we discussed not going into details about X, Y, and Z, so I will not answer that. You know, different, different things like that, being able to stand up for themselves in that particular situation. A game plan is also very key to this. The question and answers definitely help with the game plan of, you know, what are you going to do if, and I like to call that the what if game, you know, what if the reporter asks you this? What if they do that? What if they say this or, or whatever else is going on? Walk through all of the possible negative things that could happen and the possible great things that could happen. And that goes back to some of those questions we asked earlier too. So, you know, what if this does go viral? What does that mean for you? What if your anonymity is exposed? What's our plan in this situation? Walk them through that plan, but also walk them through what the interview itself is going to be like. I think there's so much fear of the unknown when someone does an interview for the first time. And so saying to them, you know, this is typically how they put the mic on you. They'll do editing, they can make you sound better if you stumble over your words or whatever else and just ask them about it. 
where should you look in the situation if you know the reporter, letting them know what that reporter is like and their style and maybe some questions they might ask based on previous interviews. And it's also okay to, when the reporter gets there, set those parameters of, you know, this is what we discussed, this is what they're willing to talk about, setting those boundaries again, like you probably did over the phone or over email, but then asking like, hey, so, you know, where should they be looking? How, you know, tell us about the microphone, tell us about the editing process to try to put them at ease at the beginning and letting the reporter know that that will help them get a better story is is really advisable too so if you are understanding you're kind you're empathetic you're going to get a better story so if you take that little extra time to walk them through this they're going to be much more comfortable with you and share more with you if you do that as a part of the walkthrough or the game plan i would also like to even if it was a situation where you get the call at three they want to interview at 3 30 and it goes on the news at five and there's a survivor involved try to get that survivor to be able to meet with you for just like 15 minutes before to go over some of this stuff is is a really good idea and even maybe asking to push back that time if you need more time ask for more time they'll let you know if they can do it or not and if you feel like there's not going to be enough time it's okay to say no to that interview it really is okay to say no to interviews but i would advise against not doing that a whole lot only do it when there's a specific reason for it so like we can't get a survivor here in time this isn't enough time for us to prepare and plan you know this isn't something that we're going to comment on at this time those different kinds of things are reasons why you could say no in the situation to an interview but as a general rule i would say definitely try to do the interviews if possible but there are some circumstances definitely where it is not possible Working with reporters is one of the one of the last sections I believe we'll end up talking about today. And it's like I said before, very important to develop relationships, but we're also going to talk about what they might need to know and some resources for you and for them as well if they're asking you for those kinds of things. Relationships, relationships, relationships. If you take nothing else from this and you're somebody who wants to start doing interviews, do more interviews and things like that, relationship is key. Network. If you're not networking just in general, I highly advise that you start doing that because you're missing out on people and experiences and just um, job opportunities and things like that if you're not networking. So do that and look at this as another way for you to network when you're developing relationships with people within the media. If you develop a great relationship with someone, with a particular reporter or something like that, what you can do is you can contact them directly and give them the scoop in the situation. Let them be the one who gets the story in this situation. Uh, there was one reporter who I worked with who was absolutely fantastic with survivor interviews. She was extremely caring, made the environment very comfortable, would let them take breaks if they needed, hand them the tissue, you know, not ask victim blaming questions and things like that. And so anytime I had a new survivor who was willing to share their story on camera, for the first time or they've been sharing their story a lot and they um, you know wanted to go on camera now and share it she was the one I went to I would give her the story first because I knew she was going to treat myself and those survivors right in the situation and not use victim blaming language and, and do all those other things that are, are not so good when working with survivors she was really respectful of the trauma and things like that that the individuals had been through so if you have someone like that continue to develop that relationship and give them the inside scoop it's really important as well to follow up follow up is key in continuing those relationships so if that reporter does a great job like the one I was just talking about, send them a follow-up email, give them a follow-up phone call and express how happy you were about how things went or how they did such a great job working with that particular survivor. Let them know that. You can also let them know when you're unhappy with what they have done too. It's great to follow up directly in person in those situations or if you see something overall once you've developed good working relationships to be able to put a press release or a statement out there to give you an example of this. 
Um, that same case that I talked about earlier where there was an individual who was exposing himself, every single news station that I saw their coverage, they very much focused on the sensationalism of it and not here's information for people about what they can do, about who they can go to, how to report, all these different things. It was just like, oh, wow, this is terrible and disgusting and not super helpful. So I sent out press releases or a statement to all of these different groups saying, you know, this is how our organization feels about this. We need to be able to provide people with information and let them know there are services available to them instead of just focusing on how terrible this is. We need to help people and you have an opportunity to do that as well. So there are avenues to do that, but I would only recommend really doing that once you have that relationship in place or following up directly with that particular person who you were not very happy with the situation. You can even do that after after the interview too. So if there's something that was said um, during the interview that you would not like included or misconstrued, let them know, tell them about that. But overall, especially give feedback and follow up when something has gone right. In wrapping up the interview, you definitely want to be a resource yourself. So you want to be timely, you want to be accurate, you want to be really, really easy to work with in that situation. And in wrapping up the interview, what you can do is you can ask them questions like, you know, when will this air? How is this going to be edited? Or how do you see this, you know, fitting into the newscast? And give them your card or your contact information. And you can ask to be added to their database. I know a lot of television stations have databases of people who they can contact about typical topics or issues or things like that. And your name can be in there if you give them your card and say, hey, I want to be added to this particular list. And you not only can um, follow up, I should have mentioned this earlier, you can not only follow up through calls and through emails and things like that, but maybe you know this particular reporter is super active on social media. So once their footage airs and it's out there and you really like what they did or said with that particular interview, you can share it and you know tweet at them at the same time kind of thing if they're really active on Twitter or thank them via Twitter or share that this is going to be you know aired tonight via Twitter or whatever else and then tag them in it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever else, you know, sharing the story, tagging them in their personality page or or whatever else are some other good ways to keep the relationship going, as well as good ways for you via social media to get your message and information out. So it's kind of a twofold thing there. Moving on to the next portion of this. What I want to hear from you is what you think reporters need to know. What do you think they need to know? Is it the basics of domestic and sexual violence? Do they need to know about the survivor's parameters or requests for the interview? Do they need to know about the power of their language and victim blaming and the terminology that they use? Or is there is there anything else that you think is important? Let me see here. It looks like we've got some comments. Um, let me see here. It looks like good tip on the database. Um, if you don't have cards, you can definitely write down your information for them. Let me see what else. Breathe is the last thing somebody does before they speak in a Q&A. That is a really, really great point. Take that time and decompress. Don't stare at your notes or your talking points right beforehand. Just give yourself that moment to breathe, like this person said, decompress. And, and, and take a minute, you know, um, that's something that I think I can be guilty of too. And that's, that's another thing to recognize is, you know, take that moment, take what you need, do what you need to do in that situation. If it's not live, it's okay to pause and think for a minute. It's okay to stop and take a breather. That's, that's such a good point. Let me see here if there's anything else in the questions or if anybody's saying what they think reporters need to know. They need to know about funding for rape kits, um, changes to statutes of limitation, sharing infographics, encouraging schools to comply with Aaron's law. So a lot of really specific things. And I think those are, those are great that you all bring those up. Um, I think that 
in those situations, that's something that you could write a press release or a statement about and share that and give those direct shares to people about those particular pieces, because those would make really great stories if somebody is looking for a story. And that's something most people don't realize is a lot of times reporters and individuals, they're looking for stories. So send them that information and whether they pick up on it or not um, is kind of um, a thing in and of itself. We could do a whole webinar probably about just, um, you know, crafting statements and press releases and things like that and how to get it seen. But those things are definitely good for, for press releases as far as what they need to know about and what the general public needs to know about when it comes to this topic as well. Here's some things that I think they need to know when they're interviewing survivors. I, I did a presentation for a press association related to working with survivors and, and different things um, like that. And this is really what came up is just having a basic understanding of domestic and sexual violence is really, really key. So they're not using those victim blaming language things, um, which we'll get into in a minute here. But I like to kind of have my domestic violence or sexual assault 101 elevator speech put together. So if I'm talking to them on the phone, setting up the parameters of the interview, you know, letting them know a little bit about um, what domestic violence is, what sexual violence is. You could also do that with trauma, kind of having your neurobiology of trauma 101 speech prepared so they can have a better understanding of what it's like having gone through a situation like that before they interview survivors or just interview you about this topic in general. If they're working with a survivor, I think it's important for them to know about triggers, um, to know what triggers are. Um, you know, if they happen, don't be offended. You know, give that person time and space that they need. If you cause the trigger, you know, just apologize or remove yourself from the situation in a, for a moment or something like that and, and just give them what they need to feel safe in that moment. Maybe it's a support person that they have with them that just sits there quietly during the interview right next to you or, or something like that. But creating that safe space and providing time and understanding, I really try to make it clear to reporters, is what's going to get them a better interview. It's what's going to help that person open up and share. And so it can be a mutually beneficial situation where they get the information they need and the survivor feels like they have the empathy, the understanding and the positive reception and sharing that they need as well. Another thing we talked about was language and asking questions. So if they feel any implication of guilt in the way that the question is asked, like it's their fault that this happened to them, that's probably going to shut somebody down right away or really upset them. Also asking why questions was another thing I brought up that's not necessarily a good thing to do because a lot of times defense attorneys or sometimes law enforcement who aren't trained in trauma related techniques of interviewing might ask those why questions, those kind of blaming questions. And then even within the piece itself, what, what kind of language are they using? Are they saying sex instead of sexual assault? Those kinds of things that can really um, drive the reader to understand this um, piece in a completely different way. Uh, that's definitely something to, for them to keep in mind as well. And then also, I just let them know about the comment section that that can just be an absolutely horrible, horrible place for um, survivors to go. I recommend not looking at it, but if things get out of hand, maybe even asking them, could you disable the comments for this particular story? This is something that sadly I didn't think about first and foremost. I always just said, you know, avoid the comments because I didn't know that the comment section could be taken down in some cases. And so there was a reporter who we worked together, had a survivor story, and she called me up and said, you know, Michelle, I just wanted you to know that I disabled the comment section for this story because people were saying absolutely horrific things about this individual and the situation, and I didn't want that person to see it. Um, she's like, we can't do much about Facebook or other things like that, but on the page itself, we can remove that so we can ensure that, you know, the survivor doesn't have any triggers or, you know, extra trauma or things like that related to, to the comments in this situation. So that is something that you could ask for. You might not always get it, but it, it is something to think about. And if you're looking for resources on 
trauma or information, um, the book Trauma and Recovery by Dr. Judith Herman is a really good one. A lot of people um, refer. And then if you're looking just for more recent information, really anything from like Russell Strand or Ann Munch, who was recently at um, one of the college campus meetings for CICASA, they have a lot of great new information around trauma and the brain and things like that. So definitely keep up to date on your research with that as well. There are some incentives for journalists who portray situations that involve trauma in a sensitive way. The DART Center for Journalism and Trauma actually gives away awards related to sensitive reporting. So this lists out what they're looking for in trauma sensitive reporting. And it's good for us to know as well for when the story comes out to kind of assess it for ourselves and think about working with that particular reporter in the future and what that relationship is going to look like and what information we can try to provide to them to, to make the pieces better in some ways and to be of assistance and be resources ourselves. Really what this boils down to is just being sensitive to the subject, to the people involved, to the places involved, and the nuances of the story. So there is information out there specific for reporters. Um, the DART Center, like I said, is a great resource. There's also this Pointer News University that has online courses for reporters. And then witness.org actually has some YouTube, has a YouTube page with videos about interviewing survivors. And these are great resources, not only for reporters, but also for people like us who are trying to prepare ourselves for interviews or prepare survivors for the interviews. In, in a lot of different ways. And so what's funny is I, I had all these personal experiences and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing a presentation for the press association. I need to have other information to back up what I'm saying because most of what this is for me is experiential. And they bring up a lot of similar things to what I say, in particular in the witness.org YouTube page videos. And the DART Center is another really great thing to look at as well. I think you might have to pay to do some of the courses online, but uh, witness.org and DART Center, I would definitely take a look at those if you want to look more into, into those kinds of things. So that kind of concludes what I had prepared to talk with you all about today. You know, we covered setting up the interview, preparing yourself, preparing survivors, and a little bit about working with reporters. So um, right now, since we've got about like 19 minutes left or so, I'd like to open it up if you all have any questions that you would like me to, to answer or anything you feel we didn't cover that you want to share with, with the group would be, would be great here. So I'm just going to pull that up and look and see if anybody has anything they want to share here related to the topic. Oh, we've got somebody saying they like Judith Herman's book as well. Definitely, yeah, that is that is a really, really great book. It's interesting how the post-traumatic stress disorder that individuals in the military suffer is compared to that of victims of domestic and sexual violence. It's, it's a really good parallel for people who don't understand the level of trauma that someone goes through, you know, like being a prisoner of war or different different things like that. So it really, really is a good, a good piece to look at. Anybody else have anything that you want to add today? I'm sure no one's going to be mad at me for, for wrapping up a little bit early here. Let's see, as a survivor seeking a second career, are there resources I should connect with? Um, hmm, not really. Um, about the topic today that we're working on. Um, I don't know, maybe, you know, reaching out to CICASA or, or something like that, um, another organization, maybe an advocacy organization within your community, if you want to be working within the field, um, helping others, starting out volunteering is a great way to go in, in my opinion. Um, if you want to try to reach me after this, you have questions you want to ask me for about a month, I'll still have my CICASA email, communications at CICASA.org. And then beyond that, um, you can contact info at CICASA, and they will get us in touch with each other if you, if you have any questions for me that you don't want to ask in, in front of the group. So it, if there's no more questions here, then I will turn it over to Rosa to do the wrap-up with you all. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Michelle. 
some really, really great tips, um, very useful stuff. I hope that you have all been able to take something away from this um, for your agency and for your community. Um, definitely don't be shy of, of media, you know, we can definitely work with them to get our points across and to get our stories out there. So thank you so much for these great tips, Michelle. We really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, if there was anything that you might have typed in the questions box that we weren't able to get to, don't worry. I will definitely send those out to Michelle um, after the webinar, and then she can follow up with you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can also email myself if you have any questions about the webinar itself. Um, know that we do have some upcoming webinars. Our webinar for next month is going to be about the Vine um, system that's in place. Um, that's going to be October 16th at 1 p.m. And in November, our webinar will be from our member agency, Dove, which is Deaf Empowering um, uh, which is our deaf um, survive, sexual assault survivors program. So we look forward to having them um, in November. So please, again, fill out the survey at the end. We really appreciate your feedback. And thank you so much for attending today's webinar. We will see you all soon. Thanks again.